Welcome to Are You Real Linked? A journey together toward a deeper, more authentic connection with God and with others. Through teachings of prayer and faith, our common stories of business, relationships, and personal growth will give you the direction you need to truly feel linked with the lost, hopeless, and hurting to help restore your community. Now please welcome your host, Christy Austin. Hello, Roar Nation. This is Christy Austin, your host of Are You Real Linked? Connecting to Deeper Faith. And I am super excited today for our very first interview. And we are actually live here in Toledo, Ohio with George and Sarah Williams of City Light Church. I do want to share real quick, in case you're wondering, you can still catch Are You Real with John Fuller every Wednesday on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. We are going to start today. And as we've been walking through Luke 10 together, and as you know, we've been talking about what does it mean to take your city? Well, we know we live in a paradoxical kingdom, right? Okay, so to take your city, you give to the city. That just goes hand in hand. And I am so excited because the mission of Linked is prayer and practical support. And we clearly see that throughout Luke 10. Over and over, they were sent out two by two, and I believe it was for the prayer and the practical support. And so George and Sarah Williams began here. Am I right in saying that y'all launched here in Toledo in 2005? Is that right? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I am super excited. Can you just begin by sharing here how you are taking your city through the art of giving? What has that looked like for you over the last 13 years? Yeah. So for us, as you said, our story goes back to 2005. And that's kind of the place where I wouldn't say we were taking our city, but God shaped us and molded us into being city takers, the characteristics of what it of what it takes for a person to to plow in that area. And so Sarah and I, we had no idea that's what God was doing back then. Sure. We just knew, we knew two things. We knew that Jesus said the greatest thing that we can do is to love him and to love our neighbor as herself. And hmm. you know, Sarah and I were a part of a church. You know, we went to, every time the doors were open, we were there. We would, we'd, we prayed together. We worshiped together. So we we thought we had a pretty good jump start on the loving God part, but we looked around our lives and we said we couldn't identify any active way that on a regular basis we were loving our neighbor as herself. And that that really troubled me that that when Jesus says, hey, th this is the greatest commandment and I've only got to start on half of it. So we... <laughs> We That's set out awesome. to to make that our compass and saying, how do we live our lives? This is this is the compass that we live our life to literally love God and love our neighbor as herself. So we we set out on a mission. We found a neighborhood that needed a lot of love. We bought a massive house in that neighborhood that was really beat up. The house itself needed a ton of love. We moved in there. We were dirt poor. The neighborhood we were in wasn't it wasn't uncommon for dirt poor people to live in that neighborhood, so we fit right in. <laughs> and our goal was to to literally love the hell out of our neighbors Aww. in our neighborhood. So Sarah always hates it when I say that. But uh, you <laughs> listeners out there, maybe they'll edit that part out. I don't know. No, but, no um, you know what? We all have some yeah, religion. Real talk, and right? Real talk. Challenge. Are you real? That's right. That's um, right. So, so we moved into this neighborhood, you know, and we just prayed. We said, God, give us give us defined boundaries of, of wh where are our people that we're going to love? Where is our, our area where we are going to believe for? the kingdom of heaven to be on earth, you know, where, you know, and so God kind of through, we took a, we took weeks to pray and fast and, and God kind of gave us this boundaries within our neighborhood and say, these are our streets. We're going to pray for these streets. We're going to pray for these homes. People would come and say, how can we help? We'd just organize them and say, okay, we're going to go out. We're going to pray on these street corners. We're going to, 
We're going to bless these homes. We're going to door knock. We're going to hand out free bread. We did block parties. We had times where we'd cook up all the food, literally all the food we had in our house and, and invite the whole community over to our house for a dinner. There was anywhere between 20 to 100 people that would wow. come to our house. That, I mean, we That's could spend amazing. the whole time talking about the miracles that happen in there. And there was times where we... We cooked all the food we had, and it wasn't enough, and God just multiplied it. Wow! Yeah, I mean, like it was and the fish. Mm-hmm. That is it was awesome. it was crazy, and that was that was not just on one occasion; that was on multiple occasions. So mm-hmm. uh, we just we saw God provide in the the craziest craziest of ways. You know, just come home and there's all this food on our porch, fresh, not like not like day old stuff. I mean, like someone went to the store and bought hundreds of dollars worth of food and just left it on our porch. Just all kinds of crazy stuff. So it was in that place that that I think that God started shaping us and shaping our paradigms to believe that he actually was was more concerned for our neighbors and our neighborhood than we were. You know, we kind of thought like, hey, this is a good idea. And we realized that this was actually touching God's heart more than we could have ever expected. You know, fast forward um, from there, we planted a church. And out of that church, and and I'm giving you the very kind of fast forwarded version, our church experienced, I pause even using the word revival, because I know that that word means different things. And I also don't, I also don't really fully know what God was doing. But we went through a, a three week period where we were having spontaneous prayer meetings where hundreds of people were coming out. We went from a church of about 60 people to a church of, I don't know, we were having to knock out walls during the day to get ready for the wow. prayer meetings at night. There were so many people coming. Same. And out of that place, I I don't know why we were doing the prayer meetings. I don't know what the, how, we didn't know how long it was going to last. But we do know one thing that, that out of those, the three weeks where we were praying, God branded something on our heart Mm. that just can't be taken away. And it's, it was a very simple thing that happened one night during the prayer meeting, someone, someone stood up to pray and they prayed this really simple prayer. They prayed, God, save our city, God. Would you save 500,000 people? And that's, you know, 500,000 is, is the greater population of, of our city. And it, it was a very simple prayer and it may have been prayed a hundred times before, but it was something about that night and something about what God was doing saying, ask me for this. Would you ask me for this? Would you ask me for the salvation of an entire people? And that burned in me. I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It, it set a course in a direction that, that God was asking us to, to lift up our eyes. And I think even in Luke 10, it might be in the verse in Luke 10 where it, it, Jesus even says, lift up your eyes. I believe that's the Luke version. Lift up your eyes for the, the harvest is plentiful. Uh, right. And so uh, that implies that our vision was set low. And so, and so for us, we, I believe we're giving, given the charge to believe, to take a city, to, to begin asking God and moving in that direction to take a city. Well, uh, you know, for me in my heart, that was very challenging because it didn't really fit into like this theological box. Like, sure. I didn't understand, like, God, how is this even possible? Like, where is the precedent? Like, you know, I would be, I'd be challenged with verses like, guess what? The, the, you know, the path to heaven is narrow and the path to destruction is wide. And, and then just the Holy Spirit just began reminding me over and over and over again in scripture where God's heart and his will is that all would be saved. Wow. Yeah. Right. And, and Peter, it says that none would perish. And in Timothy, it says, you know, when you pray, pray, because God's will is that all would be saved. Yeah. And so I realized to believe for anything less than 100% salvation is, is to actually say, God, we're going to believe less than what your will is for salvation. Now, we, I realized that, that the reality is that Jesus says, though it is 
No, it's, it's God's will that all would be saved. The yeah. reality of hell is still very real. But his heart is that no one would go to that place. Right. And so for us to aim for anything less is for us to just simply be okay that people go to hell. And I don't think God's okay with it. And I don't want to be okay with it either. Right. So that passion in me, in us, in our community sort of took hold. So I guess, I guess that's sort of the backstory of, you know, when you ask the question, how... I'm telling you how we got to this place to sure. to sort of believe that a city could actually be taken. I remember talking to a pastor friend of mine and saying, you know, I... I want to believe this. My, my spirit wants to believe it, but my head is having a hard time wrapping around it. Because yeah. where is there a precedent for this? And he says, George, look at, look at Jonah, yes. the, the city of Nineveh. God had prophesied destruction over a city, but the entire city repented and turned to the Lord. Yeah. And so I believe that, that we, we get to have a biblical mandate to say, God, would you make this like a city of Nineveh? Would you make our city a city of Nineveh that they would repent and turn to the Lord? So the the kind of the practical things on how we do that, there's a lot of things forward steps, but we knew that the number one step in taking our city was was out of a kind of a simple verse in Second Corinthians four four. This is a this is a key verse for us in kind of understanding why why people haven't repented why have they not come to christ why has the city already not been saved and it says the god lowercase g so they're talking about a demonic kind of spiritual authority the lowercase g god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of christ so the reality is, is that there's a demonic veil over the eyes of those who don't believe. Yeah. I don't know of any, of any physical way to remove a spiritual veil. The only way to remove something spiritual is to handle it spiritually. Sure. And so we knew that the very first step to taking our city, how are we going to do this? was to mobilize mass prayer. So um, we sort of began a journey of two things. Number one, to raise raise the vision and faith level, to lift up their eyes, as Jesus would say, of the people. Sure. And then to also, we also realized that our Christian community, we all pray a little different. We all kind of pray with different emphasis. Some of us are more prophetic and declarative. Some of us are more begging and passive, right? We just felt like there was a, there was a benefit to, to say, you know, in Proverbs 11, it says, Proverbs eleven eleven. by the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, mm. but by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. We knew that we needed to teach the people how to bless and, and de declare and decree God's will over a city. So we kind of did a mass campaign of holding several very large citywide prayer rallies where we united the city of Greater Toledo. This includes all the suburbs and sub cities and, and brought them all to a central location. We gathered up pastors and leaders. And so this wasn't a one man show. We connected the pastors and the leaders to all lead different segments of the prayer. And then we broke down our society. We just used the, the seven mountains model. I know there's kind of a bunch of theology behind it or, or ideas behind it. I, I don't know anything about the theology or ideas. We just know that, hey, yeah, society is kind of broke up into seven sort of mountains, so to speak. And so we just prayed over each of those areas and we just took pastors and leaders and one would open and one would close. And we'd, we'd rally the people up into, into groups during the prayer rally. We just prayed our hearts out, but it was more than just that prayer rally. Yeah, I'm sure we accomplished a lot in that prayer rally, but what we did is we sent people home with clear prayer instructions and a mm -hmm. prayer map that we had created over the greater Toledo area. So really it was calling them together with prayer, but, sure. but sending them out with an assignment yes. um, and that assignment to, to not continue to not stop praying, but to continue to pray in their churches and in their groups and using the prayer map and some of the declarative prayers that we had, we kind of taught the greater Toledo area to pray. So that was a lot of words to tell you kind of the first step on how we're taking our city. Sure. And what I hear that I love, and I want our viewers to catch 
much because of course I'm here live, you know, and so I get to see your facial expressions and the tears in your eyes. And it reminds me so much of where Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you together, you know, and you know, I think the first step, of course, we talked about where, you know, we love strategy. And so that first step is really to get the heart of God for your city and to see the city and the people there through his eyes. And I'll tell you what, one thing that just strikes me as so beautiful is because, of course, Toledo, Ohio is, is my hometown where I was raised. And so I have family members here and I have friends and people I know here. And it's such a beautiful thing to me that y'all are crying out for them for 500,000, which will join you in that. But the other thing that I love is that, you know, we start with prayer, but there's so much more we can do in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to ask a really practical question. You know, I know when you lived in the house, you called it the Lewis house Mm -hmm. and it was in, you know, the middle of, you know, not the safest, you know, suburban neighborhood. Just really practically, like, how, what did, did you feel safe or, you know what I mean? I'm just thinking very practical things. Like someone says, yeah, God's calling me to do that too. But, you know, I'm not street smart. I didn't grow up like that. So did, did you, Sarah, ever wrestle through any of that living there? Well, I do remember when I was preparing to move into that neighborhood, it wasn't the area that I had grown up in. Maybe comparatively, the area I came from was a safer part of our region. So I did kind of wrestle with the idea, but I was wrestling with the Lord and asking him for his perspective on it. And It was really interesting because I was at a conference and there was a person who didn't know me at all who came up to me and said, I just felt to tell you that the Lord wants you to know that everywhere you go, his angels are with you and that you are so safe in the places he calls you. And that person didn't know me at all. And the Lord continued to just reaffirm and confirm that the safest place to be is in the center of his will. Hmm. And so I have counseled people many times. The most important thing to find is the exact place that God wants you, because you could be in the safest place in the natural. But if that's not the center of God's will, right? then our protection is really being in the shadow of the most high. And if yes. you're sheltered under his wing, that's the place to be. And so I found a lot of confidence and comfort in that, just knowing that I'm following his will and his voice and staying close to his presence. And it hasn't been an issue. It's been an amazing journey of faith. And I've done a lot of things I never would have imagined. And I love all of it. Awesome. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. So, oh, man, yeah. that's so cool. Now, Y'all don't live in that house anymore. Is that right? You've moved on? Correct. So we still own the house and the house is still being used for ministry. But we actually moved. We we live in the same neighborhood we started in. So we've never left the neighborhood. So we, instead of living in a massive house, we live in a smaller house nearby. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. So what practical things do you do in the house there now, the Lewis house? Yeah, sure. So we still own the house and there's just been a, a group of gals that have have moved in and they just do hospitality kind of stuff. And then Sarah and I have um, really for us, it was a while back ago as we were ministering out of this place and we were having lots of people come over for dinner and we were doing block parties and we were praying for people. But I remember the Lord, it was a, it was a really deep conviction. And it was one of those things like sometimes the Lord just talks in very clear ways. And it was almost like he was talking right into my thoughts. And and I felt like he was saying this. It's like, George, it's time to be responsible for the condition of the soil that the seeds are being sown into. And so what do I mean by that? It's like, we were seeing a lot of people being touched by the love of God, being being touched by the love that we were showing them. And they were ready to make some next step decisions in their life. We, at that point, did not have any next steps to give them. We didn't have any, any place where they could grow and they could develop into what God was calling them. We, didn't, we weren't able to walk with them on their spiritual journey, right? We were able to love them, but not help them grow. And so we, need, we knew that we had a discipleship problem. Wow. And so we had prayed, God, would you send a, this was our prayer, would you send a transformative 
relevant and life-giving church to our community. Transformative that, that people, that it would literally change the way that people's behavior, they would change their lifestyle, it would change, you know, they would they would move from, from lawlessness to righteousness. And by relevant is the reality that, like, we had a lot of great churches in our neighborhood, but they often didn't look like our neighborhood. You know, 100-year-old churches where they looked more like, like the suburbs where people had moved mm-hmm. to, but still drove into the city. But people that actually lived in the neighborhood didn't go there. And, yeah. and, and balanced was the fact that we wanted to make sure that wherever we were at, we could we could point to the kingdom of God, but still a church that still spoke into their lives where they were at right there. So, well, that, that was kind of a, a lot. And that was our that was our prayer. God, would you would you send a church? Would you send a church? And ultimately, he answered our prayer by saying, sounds like a great idea, guys. I'm going to send you to go do that. Um, <laughs> So you never wanted to start a church, is no. that right? It no, just kind we of didn't. We, we were praying that God would send <laughs> us a church, but He called us to it. But I just could I just add when you had asked just ways that we reach the neighborhood. One thing that we did from the beginning that we even still continue to do that we've just found a lot of favor in is that we will go door to door. We'll go out on the streets and just carrying a simple gift. And we found that sometimes a gift just makes a way to impart blessing for people. And it's really opened doors for us to just have God encounters. We've seen so many people physically healed when we just give them the invitation for prayer. Is there something I can pray for you about? Or, you know, just embracing that in the hard places that they're at. And we've just seen from the beginning and even to now, that be such a phenomenal way to reach people. And, you know, as far as the girls who do live at the Lewis House still, I I would say that's probably the strongest model that we've carried of outreach. Even last weekend, we were we were doing that same kind of thing downtown. We had homemade knitted hats, just masses of them that We were giving to people on the street and God just encountered people. And we love that method of reaching people. And that's just been really fruitful for. And I happened to see on Facebook, I think it was last weekend that y'all were handing out hot chocolate to those waiting for a bus. Of course, this is a very cold climate up here. And so you're just simply handing out hot chocolate to those waiting on the bus. I thought, what a great practical way to demonstrate his love. It's really awesome. Yeah. Love it's so it. much fun. And yeah. it's cool because we use a gift to earn favor and trust with people because we don't expect them just to want to hear what we have to share or want to let us pray for them. But when you give someone a gift, they not only receive the gift, but they receive the giver. And so sure. what we've found is is we'll go out on the streets to pray for people or to minister to people. But it usually doubles our effectiveness if we just bring a really practical something that that they would enjoy. I mean, we've done this for years. Uh, We went door to door and did handmade cookies, you know, home baked cookies where all the people in our church baked cookies and we had boxes that they, you know, would put them in all the same kind of looking boxes that they put them in. Then we go door to door. We once did a thing with Starbucks coffee. We we went Mm -hmm. to the store and literally cleared the shelf out of Starbucks coffee (laughs) and went door to door. People are blown away when you do something like that. Offer them Starbucks. Starbucks coffee. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> or really hot summer days out at the bus stop or at a park, coolers of ice cold water, soda or something like that. It goes a long way to bless people with just a small gift and and God really uses it. Like we've just really seen some powerful ministry wow. through that door opening. Yeah. So we don't really stop there then usually that sparks conversation. And what we do is we always ask you know, we, we begin with prayer and we ask the Lord, okay, tell us about who we're going to run into. You know, I just believe that God speaks to those, especially to those who will listen, you know, those who have ear to hear, you know, let them hear. Right. So we say, okay, God, tell us a little bit about the people we're going to run into. And, and we do, we run into, it blows, it blows people away every time when they ask God to speak to them, they write down what they hear and then they go out on the streets and they find, you know, oh, I heard the name Samantha. And the first person I talked to, her name was Samantha. And I got to actually share what God was saying yeah. to them. And so, because we, what we've, what we've realized is God loves these people way more than we do. That's right. He wants to reach them desperately. Mm-hmm. And so we just, we just partner up with him and get to do that. And it's a blast. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. amazing. Mm-hmm. Yes. I hope to get to go on one of those with y'all. Mm-hmm. That sounds great. 
Um, I want to ask you, you know, because are you real? And so we're going to be real for a moment. We've all been in ministry and we know there's seasons where you struggle with discouragement or dryness. What have you found to really be the key? Because how y- y'all have been doing this about, is it 13 years? Is that right? 12 years. 12, 13. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what has gotten you through for someone to be 13 years in ministry? I know you've seen a lot, felt a lot, all those things. What has gotten you through those dry seasons? What's kept you persevering? Okay, I'll answer first. <laughs> I would say the number one thing is that you you just have to have a vibrant relationship with the Lord, that you stay filled up in relationship with Him, in His presence, in the Word. You know the promises that you're standing on. Being a worshiper and just, just being filled in His presence is so essential so that you can minister out of an overflow. And certainly we do go through dry seasons, but I've found that the best way to safeguard is to really learn the pace that's going to keep you in for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And I certainly haven't mastered that perfectly, especially at the beginning. But through the years, just really learned what is the rhythm that I need to pause, you know, spend times, date nights, talk time in your marriage, um, the downtime vacation, time with family, spending time with the Lord. Those essentials have to actually be built into your schedule so that they're not compromised in the grand scheme of things. And I feel like that really helps set a course for the longevity. And we're in it. You know, we're in this. We are committed to our city and we just believe God's called us here for life. And so I constantly analyze this and, and ask the Lord to help me evaluate my schedule. So during different seasons, it'll even look a little bit different. But I come back to the Lord and just ask Him to help me order and arrange my schedule so that I'm living not at constant burnout. Yes, we live a full life, but in a rhythm that's going to be a pace that can be sustained so that we can be here till we're old, bringing the kingdom and and loving our city and and impacting for the long term. Wow, that's amazing. There's a lot in there. There's a lot Mm. in there. That's really good. George, what about you? Yeah, so there was a point back several years ago where things were hard and it wasn't that anything wasn't going well. It wasn't that things weren't continuing to grow. I just felt like everything that we were doing was difficult Mm -hmm. and I felt sort of even out of place a little bit in doing it. And I remember standing in my backyard. I just remember the place I was when, when I felt like the Lord spoke this to me. And it was out of um, Psalm 127. It says this, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And, And it was a very clear revelation to me that I was building a lot of things for the Lord. Yeah. And in, I think in like in earnesty of heart, like I, I was, I'm doing this for you, Lord. I want you to be happy with this mm-hmm. thing that I'm building for you. And the Lord was like, actually, that's not mine. That's yours. You're building it for me. Great. But that's not mine. I mean, I took that. I mean, I just took that to heart and took that moment and said, God, this is, th- these ministries are your ministries. This church is your church. It's not my church. I will be your builder. I will be your manager. I will be your steward. I will be the champion that, that blood, blood, sweat, and tears, but I don't own this thing. That's good. And that was the most freeing feeling I ever had to literally in my heart sign over the deed uh, to all the ministries, all the things that I was doing yeah. to the Lord and say, That's you good. own this. Yes. Yes. I, I think we've all had to walk through this driving mm. lesson. I know I have. It's like think that the Lord needs our help. And for me, it's like, well, no, that's more flesh. And I don't need that. Actually, (laughs) I need more of my spirit to flow through Mm -hmm. you. So what a great reminder. Thank you. Can you share with us one of your favorite stories about someone who's just been radically or deeply impacted in your work in the city? That Man, there's so many stories. (laughs) So, so many stories. I want to move kind of back to the the kind of grander picture of taking our city. Please. I think that one of the things that has been amazing to me is to see as we have um, rallied together the pastors and the leaders in our city 
I knew at first that I wasn't expecting everyone to get it, right? I wasn't expecting everyone to just like, hey, I've got this vision, I'll jump on board. I knew I knew that there's no one that wouldn't want to rally around prayer. And so that was kind of the thing that we gathered all the the pastors and leaders in the city, like, hey, just come pray with us. Just come pray with us for the city. But to see, you know, in some pastors, some leaders in our city had definitely already had had that faith level, already had that expectation, but maybe hadn't been kind of encouraged by the Lord to spearhead something. But seeing just some of the different pastors and the leaders saying, George, we we can have greater faith and beginning to mobilize their churches to begin praying into the salvation of, of an entire city. Pastors that, that were saying, hey, let's get these prayer maps out to all of our people and things like that. And so we have realized that the kind of this this John 17, 20, 21, it says, hey, basically, I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Well, and I'll just turn there. Why not? Awesome. It's the, the Bible. We all love that, right? That's right? So he says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Mm-hmm. So the idea yeah. is, is, is unity leads to salvation. So as the as the church and as the church leaders, as we begin praying together and believing together and becoming one like he is, that the that the byproduct of of unity is not unity. The byproduct of unity is salvation. That's good. And so we're beginning to to kind of see a hunger amongst the churches in our region to begin praying together. We're even seeing some of the kind of segregation that wasn't intentional, but it's just natural, like kind of the black pastors hanging out with the, their group. And the, we're starting to see that sort of not the lines aren't as clear anymore, right? Where two yeah. groups are starting to hold events together yeah. and the colors are blurring a little bit more, which is really, really cool yeah. because it's not about being intentionally diverse. It's just being kingdom. Yes. It's like, this is just because we're kingdom, not because we're trying to make something happen. What right. It's going to look like. Yeah. That's yes. what heaven's going to look like. So if someone is in their city and they're just the beginning stages and I love, you know, I know this is years of telling for y'all thinking even my own city. How practically did you get pastors to come together? Do you just go visit them and invite them to things? What what have you found to be some keys there? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't think that there's a, a magic bullet. First of all, like Jesus said, like, when hey, when you go to a town, like you just kind of knock on people's doors until someone mm-hmm. like has that peace and they invite you in. If they're not, then no worries. And so, you know, I think for us originally, like we knew our tribe, we knew some of the different pastors in our city that thought like us, that okay. that prayed like us, you know, whatever. We, ca- we started connecting with those guys first saying, okay. hey, am I crazy or is this sound like this might be the Lord. So that's that we started with the low hanging fruit. And, you know, if, if you're in a city, whether you're a pastor or a ministry leader or, or not, you know, you're not a pastor or ministry leader, start kind of gathering with, with the people that pray like you, that think like you, that kind of share that same faith level as you, but, but know that like, don't set any like limits. Like you have to think like us and pray like that. You just need some first wins, right? You need some easy, you know, low hanging fruit. So we kind of cast a greater vision to some of those, some of those leaders that sort of were on the same wavelength as us um, and begin praying with those folks first. Sure. We started a monthly prayer meeting. We, I shouldn't say, Sarah and I did not start this. We joined a monthly prayer meeting that had started up recently that some other pastors had started in our city. And that has become a catalyst to to sort of reach a lot of the different pastors and leaders okay. in our city. In almost, okay. in almost any city across the United States, there are pastors that are meeting together in some capacity. It's been crazy. I think Toledo, I think we're ahead of the curve, but I also know that we're not a, an anomaly that pastors and leaders are getting mm-hmm. together. They're getting together in your city. You just got to find them. Yeah. yeah. And when the pastors get together, basically it's let's worship together. Let's pray for each other. 
just encouraging one another, have a meal together. So it's, it's just really beautiful type of gathering. Simple. It is. And you know, that has really struck me. You brought that up several times because what I've been been saying and noticing, I should say, we have just some friends that really, you know, highly gifted in hospitality. And sometimes, you know, when we look at, at the gifts, not that one's more than the other, but I feel like sometimes that gets missed. And one of the things I've noticed is hospitality is the greatest launching pad for unity, the koinonia Mm. fellowship, because without it, there isn't that. And so I love, I love that, you know, how do you bring people together? Well, food, hospitality, you know, all of those things. Mm. And so I I hear that a lot and what y'all did. And that's great. As we kind of wind down here, uh, would you share with us, you know, just be real here for a moment and share with, with us what's the most difficult part of what you do, what would you say that is? There's an element of of consistency that you need to have. I mean, there's a reason that Jesus said, you know, anyone who, you know, who plows and looks back isn't, you know, worthy of the kingdom. And it, mm-hmm. it, there is a consistency that requires, because it is not, it's not, there's times of like great fruit. There's times of summer and there's times of winter, right? But that doesn't mean that you stop plowing. So I think when you when you continue to do it, you know that because it gets tough does not mean that the Lord has told you to stop doing it. Uh, sometimes I think we mistake in that. Well, okay, it's hard. That means I'm supposed to quit. It's not easy anymore. It's not romantic anymore. It's not yeah. the honeymoon season's over. That's generally speaking that there you're no matter what you do, you're going to go through a hard season, but generally like fruit and prosperity in that breakthrough. I know that word can be over, you know, sometimes overused, but that level of consistency saying, I'm not going to stop. We, we use the word staying power mm-hmm. in our kind of circle. Like you got to have staying power. You just stay with it and there will be breakthrough. There will be fruit. There will be huge gains for the kingdom. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't change things up or get better at doing something. Sometimes you use the hard seasons to sort of recalibrate, but not quit. You have any insight on that, Sarah? Yeah, I just, I really agree with that. I just add the language of that God has timing that sometimes we don't understand, but knowing that he is the one that governs the seasons. And when we're, when we're submitted to him and we're yielded to him and we're in obedience, we have to trust that, like George said, whether it's winter, whether it's harvest, whether it's springtime and you're just planting, he is doing something at all times. And, and I think I've gained a lot of peace in my life as I've learned that God has times and seasons. Hmm. I don't think it's natural for us to, to grab that, that concept, but it can be really hard until we just rest in that revelation. And it doesn't mean that we don't still have moments where we're frustrated in the hard seasons, but ultimately knowing that he is the season keeper and his timing is perfect is a great, um, just a great comfort. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I love that. Times and seasons, very key. Well, how could our listeners connect with you? Is there a website that they could go to? I automatically want to say if you're in the Toledo area or driving through the Toledo area, check out City Light Church because uh, we did it, you know, several weeks, months ago. And it was, it was amazing. When we stepped in, we felt at home and that's such a rare thing. And so I encourage everyone that's traveling through to just stop in. But how could we connect with you guys and stay in touch? Yeah. So, I mean, if you Google City Light Toledo, um, our website will pop up and that is actually our, our website address, citylighttoledo.org. But Sarah has, she does a lot of ministry on Facebook. The Lord has just kind of used her to minister prophetically sometimes. Awesome. And so she has a Facebook page. How would they find that, Sarah? Sarah Williams. Right. Sarah Williams. <laughs> I don't know. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So you'll, yes. have to, you'll have to hunt that down. There's probably a million Sarah Williams out there, but uh, you just look like, you just look for the one that's given out prophetic, <laughs> kind of like prophetic teachings, encouragements there on 
up Facebook and you can follow that. Yes. And I know just in the time I followed that I've, I've learned many practical tools to reach a city. And one of my favorite things that I have read is the prayers over the city. And I have inserted our own city name into some of the prayers that you have released. And so I encourage our listeners to do that also to catch those prayers. And it's just a simple way to begin. It's a great first step to reach a city. And so I'm going to pray with y'all before we go today. Would that be good? Okay. So Father, we thank you so much for George and Sarah and for City Light. And God, I pray, Father, that you would bring, Father, the Moses, they're the Moses, but I pray you would bring that Aaron and the her Father, to hold up their arms, God. And so I just see it's like my dad used to have this flashlight that was called the million watt flashlight. And I pray that about their light. I pray that would just be this million watt flashlight here. And it would shine so bright on this corner. Just really, you know, this corner is even interesting because there's different bars and different things all around. And I just pray as people exit the bar that they would be drawn here to the light. And I pray um, just protection and unity that you would bind hearts and love together. Bless them tenfold, we pray. In your name, we pray. I want to just take a moment and thank you for tuning in to Are You Real Link this week. Again, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And until we meet again, remember, rest in his love, dance with great joy, and aspire to go higher each day. This is Christy Austin, host of Are You Real Linked? And we'll see you next time. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Are You Real Linked? And encourage you to visit areyoureal.org for more resources based on today's episode, as well as links to more Christian podcasts in our network and the inspiration to help you enkindle everyone around you. God bless and good day.